So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the information session for course based and professional master's programs. And we're going to start off with the first um, presenter. Uh, her name is Rachel Zula. She's from the Office of the Vice Dean of Research and Health Science Education. Hi, everyone. Um, it's very nice to have everyone join us today um, and spend your lunch time with us. So thank you for taking the time. Um, my name is Rachel Zula, and I am the Graduate Affairs Officer for the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Uh, so what does that mean? Essentially, that means all things graduate education, uh, from student life uh, to awards to um, curricular changes happen under this portfolio. So on behalf of Justin Nodwell, who is our vice dean, we wanted to welcome you to today's session. Um, it's really important that you attend. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are in third or fourth year. Some of them, some of you might be even first and second, but it's always good to know what is on the horizon when it comes to your education. And uh, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to learn about what the Temerty Faculty of Medicine can offer you. We'll be concentrating on professional masters and course-based master programs. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chats. I'm gonna, we've got a lot of representation from different program directors. So I'm gonna leave it to them uh, to speak about their program. But what I can say about the Temerty Faculty of Medicine is it is an incredible place to learn. Um, we have some of the world's experts on our faculty. Um, your opportunity to work in a hospital, get some lab experience, get some on-hands experience in your capstone projects. Um, it's second to none. It's it, it is, we've, we've spent a lot of time developing these professional master's programs because we know that there are individuals who may not be interested in pursuing a PhD or research-based master's. And there are students who are out there in their undergraduate who are very much interested in getting hands-on skills so that they can apply it into the workplace as soon as possible. Um, and that's really sort of the guiding principle for every one of these programs that will be presented today. Uh, in terms of size, the Temerty Faculty of Medicine has a student, graduate student body of about 3,000 students. And I'd say about 800 of those, 700, 800 of them are professional master's students. So that sort of just tells you how big uh, we are, we are in terms of all the degrees that are offered, the Faculty of Medicine is the second largest student body for graduate students. So it's pretty, it's pretty big. Um, there's different services that are offered through us. Uh, we definitely are starting to ramp up in terms of our professional development offerings. Um, there's certainly help and student unions that would help to orient, orient you um, and great administrators that would help you along the way. Other than that, I'm gonna leave it to the um, individual programs to let them to inform you of what, they, um, what they're about and what they can offer. And I'll give it back to uh, Natasha, but I also wanted to thank everybody here who is presenting uh, for taking the time as well. Uh, to highlight our incredible professional master's and course-based master's programs. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so the next up is Rory McEwen. Uh, he's from the School of Graduate Studies. I was muted. I'm just gonna turn my camera on for a second so you can be sure that you're dealing with an actual human being and not a recording. Um, you'll probably get confirmation of this if I have any trouble with the slideshow. So let's try to get this launched. And could someone please unmute and confirm that they can actually see the slide? Yep. Awesome, thanks so much. So my name is Rory McEwen and I work at the School of Graduate Studies. And I am just gonna be giving a super broad overview of graduate study in general, because the School of Graduate Studies works with all faculties and divisions across the university to help them uh, create and manage their graduate programs. Uh, so very quickly, I'm gonna give you an overview of the University of Toronto itself. Most of it will seem very familiar to you, so I'll be skipping through it really quickly. I'll be giving you some takeaway messages that you really should hold to heart at the end of this presentation, 
And then I'm going to give a bit of an overview of what graduate study is like and how to find the right programs. So first and foremost, University of Toronto, who are we? Well, as you know, we have three, we have the largest research university in Canada. We have three campuses, home to over 90,000 students, more than 20,000 of whom are in graduate programs. That is to say, masters and doctoral programs. We don't include programs like the MD uh, in medicine, the JD in law. Those are known as second entry undergraduate programs. We have an incredible diversity of programs available with 400 official areas of study, plus many unofficial areas in over 300 graduate degree programs offered by more than 90 different graduate units. So there are a few things you may want to consider about this. We're also located in Canada's largest city, which gives all sorts of employment opportunities and cultural opportunities. We have world-class research facilities and you'll be more familiar with the labs, but I'm also talking libraries. Uh, U of T students have access to better journal articles, uh, sorry, more recent and up-to-date journal articles, more obscure journal articles, than, university, than students at peer institutions in Canada, because we have the third largest library in North America after Harvard and Yale. Here are the things that I want you to take away from this presentation notes. So you're going to be hearing from a number of speakers from different programs, and even if they're all in the faculty of medicine, they represent an incredible diversity of programs, because graduate studies are very, very decentralized. If you've done your research into a particular graduate program, know what the admission requirements are, know what the program requirements are, don't assume that you can transfer that knowledge over to another program. What's true for one program may not be true for another. The other thing that you'll want to know is that basically everything I'm telling you today is available to you online. All that information is out there. But universities are possibly not the finest user experience design experts uh, for web design in the world. So finding the information can be a bit tricky. We're here to give you some, some pointers in the right direction. And if you do decide to apply for graduate study, bear in mind that everything about the application process will take longer than you think it does. And also, you're not applying alone. You're applying with support from referees who will need time. So what's the difference between graduate and undergraduate study? Even in a professional program like the ones, the course-based programs that you were considering today, students are the generators of knowledge in seminar classes. That's just the way it works. You, as, a, as a graduate student in a seminar, are partly responsible for educating your peers. Uh, the teacher-student relationship is different from undergrad. It's not quite so much teacher-student as senior colleague, junior colleague. And we'll skip over my silly analogy uh, because we don't have the time. So the questions you need to ask in deciding whether graduate study is for you are pretty simple. You need to know what your goals are. What do you intend to get out of this program and how much time and energy and money are you prepared to commit? Are you Planning to advance your career in a specific profession, and is this degree really going to boost you there? Are you passionate about a given subject? Uh, are you hoping to have a career in research? If so, well, those are the other degree programs offered by the faculty of medicine, the research-based programs. Master's degrees that in professional streams take between one and three years to complete. Nothing in, nothing in medicine takes as long as three years. That's over in architecture. Uh, they are course-based, and most programs in medicine will include an internship. And they're preparing students for careers in specific professional niches. No, I'm, I'm listing a whole bunch of non-medicine graduate programs here because I am working for the School of Graduate Studies and I sort of have to give a nod to the other programs as well. Finding the right program. You might start on the web page of the School of Graduate Studies and sure, that, that, that's okay. But as I said, we're providing information about over 300 graduate degree programs and that amount of information can be overwhelming. Sometimes Google is your best friend. Also, sometimes LinkedIn is your best friend. If, if you want to know of, if, if graduates, a particular professional program is right for you, it's often very good to reach out to people working in the field that you want to work in. People are surprisingly willing to have a 15-minute you know, chat, especially in the pandemic. Everyone's got Zoom uh, to talk about what's needed to get ahead in their profession. So you then want to know what's involved in the program. What are the courses that are required? How long does it take? What is the practicum like? How does the practicum fit in? And you also want to ask yourself whether or not you can afford your, uh, the, the program. Uh, in professional programs, master's programs, students usually are self-funded. Uh, there are, however, some external awards that you can apply for outside of the university uh, or community-based awards. We also have helped develop a tool called the Award Explorer, uh, Working with Enrollment Services. So you can actually look up almost any award that's available on campus and see if it's available for you. Many students in professional programs take out 
OSAP or equivalent loans. And there is also the possibility of employment. If an internship is built into your program, that's going to help you pay or cover your costs. We do see other students looking for other work on or off campus, but you really do have to ask yourself, do you have time for that? And we often find that students are, are very happy taking a year off after undergrad, gathering their forces, burning a little bit of money, decompressing after four years, especially with you know, two or three of those years being during the pandemic. That's a lot of stress to process. So time off is not a bad thing. On the other hand, if you do take time off, you want to make sure you speak to your reference letter writers before you take that time. Application and admission, what do you need to get in? You need to have an appropriate bachelor's degree with an average of at least mid B from a recognized university. For all U of T students, your university degree is recognized. The question of whether or not your undergraduate degree is appropriate is a question that's determined by the program that you're applying to. And different programs within the Faculty of Medicine will have very different requirements of what they expect you to have covered in undergrad. So make sure you're reviewing that information very carefully. There may also be additional requirements above and beyond those minima, and, th and those will vary from program to program. The application is online through the School of Graduate Studies application site. You submit unofficial transcripts, contact information for reference letter writers, some kind of statement about why you want to be in the program, and any other requirements that your program has specified. Bear in mind, pulling all this together can take longer than you expect, so give yourself plenty of time to put together a really good application that really lets the program know why you'd be a good fit. So, as I said, give yourself lots of time. Remember that your referees need time. And remember also that sometimes applications for funding deadlines uh, may come before app uh, program application. Thanks so much. And I will hand this off to the program specific speakers. Thank you so much, Rory. Uh, so next up is Alim Lalani uh, from Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. Great. Thanks, Natasha. And hopefully the presentation is up on the screen. All looks good. So yeah. occupational therapy at U of T. This is a, uh, what Rory had talked about was a professional master's program. So there's a number of professional master's programs at U of T, but the word professional implies that you're, you're training yourself for a profession. But instead of vocational training, this is a mix of uh, research, um, course-based work, and hands-on training as well. So the occupational therapy program at U of T is two years full-time, including the summers. It's offered at both the St. George and Mississauga campus. It's an accredited program. And when you finish the program, you're eligible to write an exam to become a registered occupational therapist in Ontario. So that's better. So um, what do occupational therapists do? Um, they effectively will uh, provide rehabilitation services that bring someone back to their everyday occupation. So what is that occupation? Do they play the piano? Do they type at a computer? Um, are they a homemaker? Do they need to hold a child in their arms? Do they need to operate heavy machinery? So what an occupational therapist does, again, is it, is it provides a tailored rehabilitation program, physical and mental, that brings the person back to adjust to their everyday occupation. So where do occupational therapists work? We call them OTs for short, uh, everywhere. <laughs> They're in schools, employed by school boards, they work in, in government offices, making policy. They work at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, helping people with substance abuse issues. And um, they work with uh, software and computer companies working uh, on assistive technology devices. So, you know, things like uh, wheelchairs with sensors on the side so they don't hit the side of a doorway, little things like that. And of course, international settings, setting up uh, disability management programs overseas. Um, it's considered one of the top 25 jobs in Canada, depending on the source you go to. Um, and there's, if you just Google occupational therapy um, in the media, you'll see a lot of this uh, come up. So why U of T? Uh, 25 faculty who are uh, in our core. These are people who set our curriculum. We've got clinical faculty who help with our training. Uh, our facilities are up to date. We do interprofessional education. And most importantly, we have over 100 placement sites. So what that means is that in the, during the program, you'll have four six-week placements. And those placements will be in either the public sector or private sector, um, who would traditionally be employers. They're not paid placements, but these are generally employers 
who will um, uh, take you through an actual on-the-job experience that has to do with occupational therapy. At our UTM campus, um, it's a smaller campus than the St. George campus, but there's a shuttle between the Mississauga and St. George campuses, and it's a really sort of diverse city, um, and it's one of the biggest cities in Canada, in fact, if you're, if you're sort of outside of the province. Our St. George campus, of course, you're all familiar with. Um, it's diverse, there's lots to do, and the campus's uh, activities at St. George and UTM in our program, so the OT program itself, they're linked. So anytime there's like anything from like a foosball event to an arts event to game night, it's all linked between the two campuses. Now, during the program, the first year is considered a foundational year and the second year is an applied year. So what does that mean? First year, you're gonna be spending a lot of time in lectures uh, and there'll be one fieldwork placement in the first year. And they'll teach you the background knowledge you need to succeed on site. So you'll receive sort of, as we call it, textbook knowledge in things like psychosocial perspectives, in anatomy, in mental health, how to assess someone. And then you get to apply that as part of a research project and more advanced courses in the second year of the program. During the entire two-year program, we practice something called professional so socialization which is essentially getting you used to seeing uh, the type of client set and colleague set that you're gonna have in a regular job. You're gonna have a diverse set of clients and colleagues. You're gonna be subject to professional regulation. There's gonna be ethics, ethical questions and, and ethics almost tests involved uh, while you're on the job. And of course, there's significant mentorship in rehab professions, particularly OT. For research, uh, there is a research course in our second year of the program. Uh, students typically participate in the um, Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists Research Day, um, and they'll present their work. We also have our own uh, events on site, and you write a paper, you work with a partner, and typically uh, these projects are also published. So just some examples on the screen, there are research you'll see. Um, one of the more growing areas um, is uh, assistive technologies. And I'd say the number two growing area is mental health. So if these are areas you never thought of um, being part of the, you know, the Temerty Faculty of Medicine or, um, or even a rehab profession, these are huge parts of it and growing. So again, if you're coming from a, a non-science background, uh, these areas are multidisciplinary. During our fieldwork program, there's a thousand hours in total during the program. And um, ideally what would happen is you'd go on your site, you would be set up with a preceptor, which is someone who supervises you, and you would complete um, either sort of a day-to-day -day operational role or a project-based role. And you would be graded afterward, just on a pass-fail basis. And um, you would receive written feedback on where you can improve and areas of growth. So some are physical. Uh, some are with different practice area populations, whereas some focus, some might be on just your geriatrics or pediatrics, and some might focus on all age groups. And again, the settings can be public sector, private sector, clinics, private corporations and companies, going to people's homes, community centers, et cetera. It's a whole variety. We have these things called LEAP placements. Um, what these are, um, these are sort of new practice areas that OTs aren't usually in. Um, so as an example, we have uh, OTs at a soda company, funny enough, um, because there are, of course, occupational um, rehab issues that come up in private workplaces where you're dealing with huge physical loads. Similarly, we have lead placements set up in mental health in um, international uh, disability management facilities. So areas where there wasn't an OT before, we're going to put an OT in there in future. This grows the job market in general. Our fieldwork sites are all around the greater Toronto area. Uh, during non-COVID times, we also have international placements in places like Trinidad and India. Uh, but ideally, you would be in the, uh, in the GTA. It's a mix of facilities. Um, everything from you know, your healthcare facilities to private companies, as I mentioned, um, all the facilities have been vetted. So we actually physically go to those sites and we make sure that those sites are meeting our standards. During the program, there's also mentorship. So you're not alone. Uh, you're in a mentorship group who are in a, and assigned a specific mentor who's an OT. And they take you through the professional social socialization and how you're gonna to adjust to becoming a rehab professional. OTs are also part of the Temerty Faculty of Medicine's interprofessional education. And I realized I mentioned that before and, and didn't expand on it. 
So this is what it is. It's effectively using your occupational lens to work with other healthcare professionals in the uh, Temerty Faculty of Medicine. So again, doctors, um, physical therapists, speech pathologists, et cetera. And it's not all work. Uh, there's a very vibrant student scene in our program. The activities are not just sports. As you can see, we have everything from arts nights, virtual nights, game nights, um, everything else in between, uh, city walks, et cetera. So it's, it's really, really just like a really lovely, cohesive class. Just some examples of our activities here. There was a singing night and a, uh, a technology conference, dragon boat, and a sign language class. Like just the diversity of activities you see there, it kind of speaks to the profession and the type of people it attracts. Very multidisciplinary. The cost of the program, you're looking at around 13,000 a year with tuition and fees. Uh, the placements are not paid and we do have needs-based bursaries available in our program. For admission requirements, Ideally, you're going to have an A minus average or higher. So we call that uh, a sub GPA of 3.75 approximately. That's our average. That's on a four point scale. Um, there are no prerequisites for occupational therapy. You just need to have a liberal arts or science bachelor's degree from a university. You're also going to submit a personal statement, uh, which um, typically is going to ask you why you want to become an OT and your understanding of the leadership role of the profession. The resume. Um, it's just a typical resume, but it's only two pages. You've got to manage your space carefully and two references. So one would be professional and one would be academic who can speak to whether you would become a successful healthcare professional. During the application process, you'll be sent a survey asking you if you would like to be at the Mississauga campus or St. George campus, or you have no preference. And um, this has no effect on your admission. It's just um, something that we try to take into account if you're admitted to the program. This is this year's uh, cycle. Uh, the deadline was in January, and the offers of admission always go out in the early to mid-May. So just to sum up what I just said, you're going to have that four-year liberal arts or science bachelor's degree. You're going to have some exposure to the, to the profession of OT, maybe volunteer work, paid work, internet research, et cetera. Um, you're going to have an A- minus to an A average in your uh, last 10 full course equivalents. That's your last two years. And... Um, you're gonna have strong and positive references. How to apply, these are managed through the Ontario University's Application Center. They have a rehab wing, just like they have a law school wing and a med school wing and a teacher's college wing, they have a rehab wing. So for these rehab programs, that's occupational therapy, physical therapy and speech pathology, they all go through this website. And the application deadline is usually the first week of January. And that is my contact information that goes to an actual human. I appreciated Rory's uh, reference to that. Yes, this is not automated nor recorded. This goes to an actual person who, and you will get a response uh, fairly quickly. So feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, next up is Stacy Houston uh, from Genetic Council. Hi there, let me just get my slides up here. Perfect. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Stacey Houston. I'm the program director for the um, MSc in Genetic Counseling program at Sickets, or at U of T. Sorry, I'm based at Sickets too. Um, so our program was founded over 20 years ago. And just to introduce a little bit about what genetic counselors do, uh, we have specialized training in medical genetics and counseling. And our goal is to help individuals integrate genomic information and make important decisions about their health. So this can include interpreting genetic test results, providing guidance and support to patients and families who may be seeking more information about how the inherited condition might affect them or their families, which genetic tests might be um, relevant or right for them, and also facilitate informed decision making. So this data comes from a recent professional status survey, um, a North American uh, status survey. So certainly it's a growing profession with a variety of job opportunities. And while the majority of counselors work in direct patient care, so about 52%, some work in a combination of, of non-direct care, direct care, and maybe researched um, as well. So many counselors work in a variety of clinical areas, um, pediatrics, prenatal diagnosis or cancer, as an example. Um, and many counselors may work also in uh, molecular laboratories, um, solely within research, within hospitals, um, or in private industries. 
So our program is a full-time degree program, two-year program with a summer placement. Um, students um, gain academic knowledge and clinical skills so that upon graduation, they can work as highly competent genetic counselors in a variety of uh, practice settings. So the courses are developed and taught by mostly by genetic counselors, tailored to the specific development of the fundamental knowledge that is required for um, clinical competency. Students begin um, in first semester, first year to understand the patient experience by um, being exposed to many of these common genetic conditions, along with, um, so they get a lecture from a specialist within this area, as well as a patient-led session um, that gives them firsthand information on how, what it's like to live or deal with um, a chronic condition. Um, and certainly students have reported this as a powerful understanding of learning what it's like to be a patient with a variety of different conditions. We have partners um, for, in a variety of clinical sites in the GTA, um, and certainly this helps support um, the ongoing development of our um, clinical learning skills, clinical skills. Many of the, them are um, housed downtown or, and our home base is at SickKids, um, and certainly the sites are accessible either by foot or by transit. In semester two, our exper um, experiential rotations allow students to develop um, counseling skills and get exposure to various clinical situations and different genetic conditions in, this, in these types of rotations. And the courses, um, again, in second year, begin to develop on those from first year with and they include various guest speakers from leaders within the U of T community and include discussions of ethical and professional practice issues that are certainly going to become important within the clinical practice. Our program is also a non-thesis master's program, and, um, but students develop and complete an independent research project of their choice, which um, again is uh, the majority are able to publish that upon graduation. The clinical rotations in second year include, include increasing clinical responsibility um, and a way to develop their counseling um, competencies under supervision. And students also have the opportunity for a four week elective in the various, um, in various areas, including clinical and non-clinical options. As I mentioned, there's a six week summer placement and we encourage students to pick this at a site of their choice outside of the, nor of the normal rotation um, uh, placements, because this gives them opportunities for different learning opportunities and networking opportunities. I'm cur we're currently trying to get a placement in the UK for a student who's interested in, in working in the UK. And so certainly we work with um, genetic counselors worldwide to try to um, accommodate those type of requests. And we have other um, supplementary activities, including journal club and reviews and case rounds. Um, in order to um, supplement a very clinical um, learning style. So uh, some of our highlights, so we're, it's a we have a broad rigorous training program. Our graduates are highly sought out and hired into a ver variety of clinical and lab and research positions. Um, and so certainly we're highly competitive amongst the other genetic counseling programs. Um, again, as I mentioned, our clinical rotations are within walking distance and things are hospital things are, are, are sort of focused or, and, and um, available in the downtown core. So more information about our application and the requirements are on our website. Um, certainly we have a, a large virtual um, information day that happens in November. So if you certainly would like to be added to the distribution list, you can um, take down our email here. Um, and I will, I'm certainly happy to answer questions and I'll be, I have to leave early, but we'll be here at least for the next um, little bit if there's any specific questions um, for me. Thank you so much, Stacey. So next up is Translational Research Program, um, Dr. Joseph Fehrenbach and Emma sanchez Willis warren I don't, I can't turn on my camera. We'll give you Perfect. Co host. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Joseph. I'm the program director at the Translational Research Program. I'm joined by. Emma Sanchez. 
very nice to see everyone here today. Just before I go ahead, can you see my slides all right? Yes. Wonderful. Yes, I work here with the Translational Research Program, and it's fantastic to speak to everyone today. So we're going to take a slightly different approach. Um, we are a graduate program. Uh, we are a professional program. We focus on translational and transferable skills. So we're a, pro, a program that essentially is a platform for innovation, for thinking how you can take research and make a difference in the community, in the real world, to implement change uh, and changes that actually impact people and patients. Um, and so that's what kind of makes us different. What I want to start with is what I the problem. You see, all of you are so amazingly, incredibly fortunate because you live in interesting times. Um, right now, the amount of research and knowledge driven by computing, driven by our understanding of DNA, our ability to edit and actually create animal models, um, it has changed in the last 30 to 40 years, everything. The amount of research being produced and research here at the U of T with our partner hospitals is growing exponentially, 3% or something every single year. Um, so the wealth of knowledge out there is, is just tremendous. But unfortunately, translating that knowledge into innovation, into devices and protocols and stuff that are being used in hospitals, that are being used in community groups, that are being used in the home, um, your devices, your watches that help you improve your well being, your health, that lags behind the publications. And so there are out there ideas, research, innovations that are hanging that you probably may know about or hear about that could be adapted to apply to people who may have dementia or urinary incontinence or um, looking into a birthing wellness, but they're not being implemented. They're not being translated. They're not being actioned on. We need you. We need people who understand science, who understand the needs that people have to be able to leverage existing research, to look in and ask people, what are your needs? Where are your pain points? What is it that you are doing or, or, or the system isn't doing for you? And be creative be problem solvers, see gaps and develop new interventions that will help people live higher quality lives. We need you to champion the future. And frankly, this is very self-serving. I live with multiple comorbidities. I'm getting old and crotchety. Um, and I know lots and lots of other people. And we all need, we're all gonna be patients at some point. So I want you to go out and innovate and be innovative so that you can help others. Um, and that's where the TRP comes in. So Emma, do you wanna talk about this? Sure, I can jump in a little bit. So you might be wondering what is translational research there's a lot of definitions out there. Um, it's, a, it's a broad field and it's evolving. One kind of basic de definition is the idea of turning observations in labs, in clinic, in community. So that wealth of research that Joseph's speaking about into interventions that improve the health of in individuals and the public, so people and their communities. Um, but this can take a lot of different forms. So there's certainly clinical applications of, of this knowledge there's also working in the community alongside people to understand 
what their needs are, where interventions and policies and practices and diagnostics, therapeutics, where that's falling short. Uh, there's the kind of innovation side of things in terms of moving research into treatments or therapeutics or devices and the economic side of that. And then there's, there's the policy aspect that changes behavior and practices. Uh, and this process of, of translation of that research into all of these elements of application is, is where translational research becomes really key. Joseph, did you want to add to that? Oh, I think you did a wonderful job. Uh, innovation, that's where we're at, at the forefront, the bleeding edge. So the real question, I guess, that we're here to discuss is, is why choose the TRP? Um, and frankly, all of the programs you are hearing about today, all of the programs that the U of T offers have their own individual merits and are excellent and will deliver a, a level of education that I would say is second to none in, in Canada and possibly even in the world. Um, so the real key is that a, you should decide to go to grad school if grad school's for you. And B, you should find a program that speaks to you and that you feel fits with your career and personal objectives. What the TRP is, is a platform for learning. We have students that are 19. We had the, last year uh, as cohort had the youngest master's student at the U of T. And we have students that are 60 plus. We have students that are um, have international experience, that are recent graduates, but we also have students that are MD, PhDs, clinicians. The variety of minds and experiences in our classes is, a, is part of what makes it such a rich experience. Because in healthcare, and healthcare related domains, you deal with lots of different kinds of people. Learning how to deal with those people, learning how to deal with difference and collaborate and be innovative and learning how to encourage and accept diversity is really important. So this is what we are about. Our mission is to challenge you to think differently so that you can become a champion of innovation, a champion of improving health, of creative problem solving, of looking at issues and evolving and, and changing them. Our toolkit is uh, problem solving and transferable and something that can evolve. Our approach is a hands-on learning by doing. In our classes, you have a capstone. You build networks and communities. You go out and you solve existing problems within hospitals or groups, or um, you. it's applied research. Emma, is there anything that I've missed? That's right, and it takes you in a lot of directions. So you might see here that we're not lecturing on specific, you know, we're, you're building skills more than anything else. Um, and so there's a lot of directions you can take this. Our students go on to work in clinical settings. Some of them are already clinicians and they apply what they learn to their practice. Some go into more of the research side of things into a translator role. Um, others work in industry, startups. We have those who go into academia. So it's a, if it's a way of learning that speaks to you, you can take in, it in a number of directions. So I think that's a great point. We don't lecture. We're not focused on exams and we're not, uh, at the end of it, you don't write a tome or a thesis. You do a project in the second year that's a capstone that's intended to have impact, that is intended to help people change lives. So you learn in the program how to actually innovate and address problems out there by translating knowledge into interventions that have impact. Um, and while you do this, you learn from other students, you learn from the community, and you uh, learn from 
the most unexpected sources, patients, people, um, and that's part of the experience that we provide. And we encourage our students to go out and seek stuff and opportunities outside the classroom, research assistantships, uh, grants, uh, projects, um, interactions in the community. So if you wanna ch challenge yourself to think differently, really consider the TRP. I've put a link in the chat, but we'll have a more in-depth info session in a few weeks. It's very hands-on. You'll get to try your hat at some of what we like to teach here at the TRP. So if you're interested, you'll find that link and don't hesitate to email us. Or check out our website or book a consult. So if you wanna have impact and change and learn to be a better you, uh, come talk to us. Thank you so much, Joseph and Emma. So next is Biomedical Communications, Dr. Jody Jenkinson. Thank you very much. Uh, every time I hear Joseph speak, I wanna go back to school. So yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, I'm here representing the uh, Master of Science in Biomedical Communications. I'm the program director. And um, the Master of Science in Biomedical Communications is a two-year uh, degree offered by the Institute of Medical Science with a focus on visual communication of science and medicine. I think we need only reflect on the past couple of years of, uh, of our pandemic to understand the absolute relevance and necessity of clear targeted communication. Um, it, it's vital to reaching the public and to disseminating knowledge um, and bridging that gap between basic science and the community at large. So in our program, students undertake uh, 17 half courses and focus on a, a wide variety of communication strategies. This, for example, is an animation that explains the role of the actin cytoskeleton in cell movement. Um, students also study illustration. This is an example of um, an information design piece that looks at the um, threat to the orangutan population as a result of human activity. Um, as well, students undertake interactive design. Um, this is a program called Conundrum that is in use currently by the Department of Anatomy and the um, Kinesiology Pro Program to train students uh, through problem solving. So who are the students in our program? Well, I, I interviewed uh, an applicant this morning who asked me, um, what is the most exciting part of your program? And it was easy for me, it's the students. We attract the most dynamic group of people who are passionate about science, passionate about visual communication. So typically students in our program are students who come with a strong science background, fascinated by science, but they're also visual thinkers. Um, we, we tend to think of them as closeted artists who, who sort of, when they discover our program, realize they can actually find an application for their, um, their desire to communicate visually. So these are students who typically have interdisciplinary backgrounds. Uh, life at BMC is, is always exciting, always changing. We're a two campus program. We have space that we share with our wonderful colleague, Joseph, on the downtown campus in, um, on McCall Street. And we also have a larger studio space out at UTM, which is where the vast majority of our courses are taught. So students have access to all of the hospitals downtown as well. They have access to our facilities out at UTM. So it's, it's kind of a great blend of <clears throat> environments. The program, as I said, consists of 17 half courses and students complete a capstone project or master's research project in their second year. This gives them the opportunity to specialize. Um, our basic core curriculum includes courses in science. So that includes full cadaveric dissection and the study of anatomy, study of neuroanatomy, molecular biology, pathology. And all these courses are complemented by additional technology courses and communication design courses where students get to work and develop skills and strategies for communication. 
We have a, a really strong animation program and our focus in the program really is on storytelling, whether that be an information graphic or a 3D animation, there's always a very, very uh, strong focus on the importance of telling stories and communicating uh, with your audience in mind. So typically we have around 100 applicants. Um, I think this year we had 115 applications. We closed our um, admissions in January and we're actually interviewing this week. We admit each year 18 students. And um, this past year, the final two year GPA of successful applicants was 3.9. That was our cutoff. Um, that's not to say that you have to have a 3.9 GPA in order to get into the program, but it is highly competitive. Um, and the tuition this past year domestically was 11,950 and internationally a whopping 40,000. So when students enter their second year and, and complete their capstone project, as I said, we have a number of areas of specialization. So you can specialize in terms of the technology that you, that you explore, but also you can look at things like health humanities, uh, graphic medicine, cell and molecular visualization, advanced web applications, UI, UX, VR, AR, um, patient education, as well as health professional education. And then we also have um, faculty on site who have expertise in paleontological or forensic reconstruction, if that's an area that you're interested in. So the admissions process at BMC is a little bit unusual. So, uh, it requires a minimum 3.0 GPA in order to apply, and that's in your final two years of study. We have uh, we require specific courses in um, science, these prerequisites, which are part of our accreditation process. Uh, we are accredited by an international body. There are four uh, such programs like ours in North America, and we are actually the only program in Canada. Uh, we also require a portfolio of art. And um, as with other programs, reference letters and letter of intent. If you go to our website, uh, you can see many of these requirements. And actually our website has really, really good information about what the portfolio should include and what you should be thinking about when you're submitting a portfolio to the program. I don't know if you can hear that raucous noise behind me, but that is the sound of students returning to campus and just being so very happy about it. They're, they're like kids in a candy store. Um, at any rate, typical question is, what am I going to do if I have a degree in biomedical communications? What can I do with that when I graduate? Well, it, it just so happens that Toronto has the largest um, concentration of scientific visualization companies and practitioners in the world. And so students go on to take uh, positions in illustration for publishing, in interactive design, animation for pharma, um, information design and data visualization, medical legal illustration, as well as service design for healthcare, project management, um, and some obviously continue in education um, pursuing further degrees. Um, I think that's my five minutes. That's about it for me. We have a also a very strong association, our uh, alumni association and the Association of Medical Illustrators are both organizations that are worth looking into if you're very curious about this profession and would like to know more. So that's it for me. Please visit our website if you'd like more information. There's lots there. Um, also, we're very active on social media, uh, Instagram and Twitter, if you uh, follow us there and you can contact us, we welcome um, any inquiries at bmcinfo at utoronto.ca. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, next up is Applied Immunology, Croatia, Canada. All right, thank you very much, Natasha. Share my screen. Um, like everybody else, I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to attend our information session and considering the graduate programs that we offer in the uh, Tamarty Faculty of Medicine. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about the Master of Science in Applied Immunology, um, which is a non-thesis based um, uh, graduate program in the Department of Immunology. Um, the program has uh, some several differences uh, relative to the traditional 
uh, biomedical sciences master's programs. Uh, first of all, it's non-thesis, um, non-thesis based. So you don't wait to generate a large volume of data at the end of your master's and then dump it all into a giant thesis at the very end. We break up the process into three small presentations and reports that get um, delivered at the end of first year, at the end of your first summer, and at the end of your uh, second year. But the similarity with a traditional master's based, traditional master of science in, in biomedical sciences or any sort of biological sciences is that you get to work in a lab. You're still at the bench, you're still generating data, you're conducting uh, novel research. But in addition to this work that you do at the bench, there's a very diverse course selection that the program offers you. So there's a core set of courses in immunology that you'll have to take, um, which is actually which is very topical given the state of the world in the last little while. Um, but also you can supplement these courses with electives in a variety of different um, subject areas. So you can take courses in pharmacology or biochemistry or molecular biology, um, business, stats, computer programming, um, uh, as well to, to round out your interests depending on which route uh, you want to go. So this program combines, you know, the lab work of a, of a, of a basic sciences program with um, a diverse uh, course selection of a more uh, course-based master of science program. Uh, the other big difference between a traditional master's program is that this is fixed length. So you know when you start, you know when you're going to end. Uh, students coming into our program external to the Department of Immunology um, will take you two years to finish, so September to September. And if you have completed a certain set of prerequisite courses in undergrad, in undergrad, um, you can enter the program with advanced standing and finish in 1.3 years. Our website has a list of these prerequisites that are required for advanced standing. And traditionally, these are for students from the University of Toronto in the Department of Immunology's undergraduate program. Now, not only are you um, uh, able to work in the lab, but there's a lot of things you can do outside of the lab that our department offers. So immunology is not just focused on you know, research. Um, there's a whole social arm of, of our department that's very, uh, very um, near and dear to the hearts of not only um, the faculty, but the students and the staff of the department as well. Uh, first of all, we have our Impress magazine, which is a student run, edited, created um, magazine that comes out three times a year. So if you have an interest in, in creative design in terms of artwork or uh, page layouts, you can volunteer with Impress and, and create these covers. Uh, if you if you have a bent for writing, you can write articles for, for Impress. So there's an outlet uh, for you there. And this magazine is sent to alumni uh, all around the world uh, from our department. So your work can be you know read by uh, people from all corners of the earth. Uh, we also have Inspire, which is our uh, outreach um, arm of our department, or one of the outreach arms of the department. And Inspire um, seeks to showcase the field of immunology and and get the word of immunology out there to the general public. And one of the things that we do is uh, in April, I think, um, students from all across the Toronto area and nearby are invited to come to the St. George campus. I think with the pandemic easing up a little bit, we can do more of this uh, this year. Last year was more virtual, but Students are invited to campus and are sort of shown, high school students are shown um, uh, different techniques in immunology and different aspects of immunology that they normally wouldn't have been exposed to in, in their schools. Um, and also the Beyond Sciences Initiative is a um, program that was started by students in the department and it, it created virtual conferences before virtual conferences were cool. Um, and um, Sorry, I got distracted a little bit. So it created virtual conferences before virtual conferences were cool seven years ago. Uh, the, the, the initiative behind it was to bring together scientists from regions of the regions of the world, which traditionally are underrepresented in science and or don't have the resources to attend these big international meetings. So everybody came together over a course of two days um, using Zoom, not Zoom, but Google Hangouts, I think it was back then. And uh, it's kind of grown into this um, very, uh, well well respected and well attended international conference that happens online every year and this was started by and continues to be um, uh, supported by students and faculty in in our department so there's a wide range of activities and initiatives that you can take part in in our department outside of just the core core research um, and then the other question that we get asked is well what can i do with a degree in applied immunology you can do a whole bunch of things. Uh, this is just a snapshot of where our alumni have gone over the last uh, seven years or so. 
Um, a whole bunch of students have ended up into their PhD program. They use the master's to kind of get a sense of whether grad school is for them. And, and, and a whole bunch of them have recently migrated to our PhD, um, uh, PhD program. Uh, a bunch of students have gone on to medical school and a wide variety of students have gone into different industries um, out there. So whether it's in pharma or the banking and consulting industry or R&D, uh, one student even started her own company. Um, you can do pretty much anything you can think of with uh, a degree from our program. Now, um, our deadlines for this year have passed for our 2022 intake. So for the students who are keen and, and are looking at uh, programs for 2023, the, the deadlines for the standard entry are is estimated to be January 15th and deadlines for advanced standing is estimated to be March 1st, 2023. But if between now and any of those deadlines, you have any questions or wanna learn more, you can visit our website at www.immunology.utrona.ca or you can send me an email at applied.immunology.utrona.ca and we will get back to you as soon as we can with information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karosh. Uh, next is Laboratory Medicine Pathobiology, uh, Dr. Adam Gottlieb and Brandon Wells. Hello, welcome everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, can you see it okay? Uh, yeah, it's good. Yep. Can you, do you want me to start up and then? Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, the purpose today is really to just introduce you to a new program. We're now uh, um, taking applications and admit for admission to the uh, third cohort of students in our uh, program. Uh, so it's a Master's of Health Sciences in Laboratory Medicine. And uh, it is part of the uh, very large department of laboratory medicine and pathobiology in uh, Temerty Medicine. Uh, next, please. So um, the first thing is that most of you most likely are not going to be familiar with these uh, professional careers. So these are actually real careers. They have uh, real uh, jobs at the end of the two-year training program. And uh, in both cases, you get a lot of practical experience uh, to prepare you to uh, step into these uh, particular positions. So first is the pathologist assistants, who are individuals who are trained to contribute to the diagnostic services in anatomical pathology. Uh, through uh, an application of knowledge of tissue and laboratory analysis of uh, a variety of uh, tissue specimens. And so um, it's um, a very uh, essentially um, focused area, but it has uh, broad implications as we'll see in a moment. The other uh, field in our program are, is the clinical embryology field. And that contributes to the clinical management via applications of assisted reproductive technology in clinical um, embryology laboratories. So uh, both of these, um, as I said, are uh, careers. And uh, through this program, you'll be able to enter these careers and you will be able to enter it at a level that has not been uh, possible beforehand because these are really new and novel programs. Pathologist assistant programs, there are two others that are um, accredited in Canada and about 10 or so in the States. Uh, and clinical embryology, uh, we will are the only program in uh, Canada. And even in the States, there are not uh, official programs. And it's likely that we're going to be part of an initiative uh, to make these programs um, certifiable as well uh, across North America. So we're really at the leading edge of these particular uh, areas. Uh, next, please. So why uh, would you like a Master's of Health Science in Laboratory Medicine? Well, as I said, it's a um, highly respected career 
that provides people in need with essential health care. So you're part of the health care team and you're an essential part. Without you, um, things would grind to a halt in both the uh, pathology world and also certainly in uh, the embryology and infertility world. So it's a real job. Second, there's actually great satisfaction in being an important part of the pathology or clinical embryology team. So at the end of the day, or at the end of the week, uh, you can say to yourself that I've actually uh, assisted and helped uh, provide uh, excellent uh, healthcare to a variety of uh, patients and uh, individuals uh, that whose tissue I have uh, uh, processed or whose uh, infertility um, uh, procedures I have participated in. Uh, thirdly, the faculty uh, are highly skilled clinical, educational, and research laboratory physicians. And uh, you also are trained by actual practicing pathologist assistants and by clinical embryologists. And the whole team is, is truly uh, very excited about this new program and uh, have been working really uh, very hard uh, to get the program off the ground. It took us two years to develop it. And now, uh, as I said, we're um, going into um, recruitment for our third uh, year. Uh, because the program is very small, we have five uh, in the uh, PA uh, program and five uh, students in the CE program in each year. There's uh, really a close community and you get firsthand exposure to all the folks uh, who are training you. And that uh, um, results in extensive career mentorship uh, by both um, uh, clinicians and by practicing PAs and practicing uh, embryologists. So you're really essentially very well taken care of um, as trained in the program. And of course, uh, we encourage and provide the opportunities for networking with uh, CEs and PAs in the hospitals, in the clinics, at the university, and as well uh, in industry. Next, please. So what are the objectives of the program? What did we feel we really wanted to accomplish uh, by training you? So the first uh, objective is, is, is very important because we want our graduates to understand the scientific basis and the research that provide the foundations of the professional practice of PE, PA and CE. So it's not just to do the job, but to understand why you're doing what you're doing, how uh, these particular uh, activities were generated, and uh, more so uh, to have you participate in the future of the fields. Because by understanding the basic science and by understanding the research components, you too, as you uh, begin your, your, train your um, um, uh, job, uh, you will be able to uh, contribute. Uh, the, uh, we also want our graduates to achieve academic and applied skills required to work effectively in the discipline. We want our graduates to gain the ability to be a problem solver, which is very important because you're gonna be faced with problems uh, throughout as you um, um, uh, approach your, your career and your job. We want you to be critical and we want you to be an innovator, a leader, and also to practice your, your two uh, fields in a moral and ethical uh, way. We want uh, our graduates to have the tools to be critical self-learners, to embrace change in the field as they occur, and to move uh, um, the field into um, precision medicine and patient-centered healthcare. So these two fields, the PA and CE fields, are not static by any means, and they continue to evolve, and we need to give you the skills to be able to, um, uh, um, to work in this evolving environment. 
And finally, we, need, we want to provide you with a very valuable student experience. And that uh, includes the experience within the program, but also in the greater laboratory medicine um, and pathobiology program, we have a very active uh, student, uh, act, uh, student uh, group um, that uh, deals with issues around uh, social issues and uh, social justice types of issues. And of course, uh, some academic issues as well. Next, please. Just very briefly, the program structure, you get core courses. So both the CE and PA will take together. And as you can see, we need you to understand uh, and have a good background in cell molecular biology, to understand the biomedical research methods, how the clinical labs work and how they're managed. What are the biomedical ethics, a very popular uh, course that we have, how to deal with biostats, especially in understanding research projects. And uh, like many of the other programs, we have a capstone project, which is a, a well uh, supervised uh, project with one of our uh, faculty. Next, please. So for the uh, clinical embryology uh, groups, then you uh, divide into your specific courses, advanced reproductive physiology, embryology, uh, um, advanced uh, reproductive technology, genetics, uh, and on and on it goes. And we also provide practicums um, where you will go into uh, infertility uh, laboratories across the um, GTA. And also we have created a new and a unique simulation lab on the sixth floor of the uh, Medical Sciences Building where you train uh, with um, all the instruments uh, that you will need uh, as a, a CE. And uh, you get uh, really one-on-one uh, -on -one training uh, under those uh, conditions. Next. And for the PAs, again, strong uh, basic principles, strong understanding of uh, pathology in our uh, first year courses. And then you go into the hospitals and work in, um, in six week uh, intense uh, blocks in surgical pathology at our teaching hospitals, all again within the GTA. And uh, you spend some time at the Forensic Institute in North York. And um, you also learn about uh, biobanking. And you, of course, have uh, an advanced anatomy dissection course. So you're very well trained, really, on a one to one basis almost in, in most situations uh, to handle uh, the specimens that come forward. Next. And then we also have a special uh, substitute course if you've taken some of the uh, courses previously as an undergraduate, which gives you a broader uh, reading and research course. Uh, next, please. So uh, I urge you to, one, find out as much as you can about the profession of uh, the PA and the CE profession uh, through the standard uh, websites, etc. And um, as you uh, heard already through LinkedIn, uh, make contact with individuals. And certainly uh, Brandon is uh, available and very um, uh, eager to provide you with um, any type of um, um, information, any type of mentorship uh, for someone who is considering uh, applying to the programs. So we're really interested in making sure that when you apply to our program, uh, the fit is going to be good, that you're going to uh, really enjoy it, that you have the interest to work in the programs, either of the fields, and then uh, and that you will uh, benefit from our uh, training. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, Brandon, is there anything you would like to uh, add? Yes, there is actually. So thank you for your presentation. Um, that was great. Um, in addition to what Dr. Gottlieb said on our website, we have a video uploaded of a previous information session we had where we go into detail about both of the programs. 
Um, it also includes um, demonstrations from practicing pathologist assistants and clinical embryologists on just kind of explaining like what the day-to-day -day life is in their field. And they kind of um, walk you through specimen analysis as well as um, briefly go over like the IVF process. So if you go on our website, you can see kind of, you can learn more about the professions and also learn more about our, our program. Bert, I'll, put, I'll put the link, sorry, I'll put a link to it in the chat as well, so you can know exactly where to find it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gottlieb and Brandon for your presentation. Uh, so next is medical genomics, Dr. Aaron Stiles. Hi, thank you for that intro. Just do the thing. <laughs> Okay, how does that look? Does that look fine? Yep, yeah, looks fine, thanks. Beautiful, thank you. All right, so thank you for giving me space to talk about our program. My name is Erin, I'm the director of U of T's Professional Masters in Medical Genomics, which we affectionately call the MedGen program. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about the field of medical genomics before I launch into trying to pitch the program to you. So studying medical genomics represents the ability to really understand and interpret and then harness and use the information that's contained in our DNA so that it can be used to help inform decisions about clinical care. Uh, and both your undergrad learning and the news have probably already told you that technical and clinical advancements in what is really a relatively new field are absolutely exploding right now. So we know a lot more about the human genome and how our genetic information impacts our health than we ever have before. And that's what's triggered this field. So because of how fast the field is evolving, we know that there's this emerging need for professionals who can really generate and integrate and interpret genetic and genomic data. Basically, people who have been trained to keep up with the fast paced nature of the advancements in this medical field. So that's really what our program is situated to provide. The professional masters in health science in medical genomics prioritizes putting our students and our grads right at the cutting edge of genomic medicine, right at the bleeding edge. And so as a program, we are really oriented towards a new era of research in clinical science where genetic and genomic data are very routinely being collected and analyzed across a huge range of patient groups and different medical indications for different purposes. The program consists of a core set of courses across a two year duration. Generally speaking, our students are only taking two pretty high intensity classes at a time. Uh, and one of the most exciting parts of the program is that it culminates in this fully immersive capstone practicum project at the end here. So our program has pre-existing wonderful supervisory relationships with a whole bunch of different groups across the GTA, across Ontario, and even a growing number of national and international partners who supervise our practicum students. Uh, and although the projects themselves are quite varied, they tend to fall into these four major categories, including clinical diagnostics, clinical research, uh, projects in biotech and in different startups, and government agencies. And then there's also always this opportunity for our students to organize a self-directed placement. If they have a specific interest, they know exactly what they want, and it's not reflected in our current placement partnerships. So what do our graduates do? and how do they meet these needs that we've identified in our healthcare system? Obviously, as students considering a professional program, that's probably a pretty important question. And as a program that has the word professional right in the title, that's something that we think about a lot. So we know that our grads are ideally suited for work in clinical diagnostics facilities or research labs, really implementing the tools of genomic medicine and filling this major and growing need in the realm of what's called genome and variant analysis and annotation. It's a huge draw there. We also know that they're attractive to publicly funded enterprises and private companies that are generating and interpreting genetic and genomic data. And that could either be for a direct to consumer company like 23andMe or for the clinic. And we also know that they're suited to a huge variety of science communication roles, project management, and consulting and health policy roles. 
some of our students are already clinicians or they're well on their way to becoming clinicians. And so when these students graduate, they either go on to complete their clinical training or they go back to their existing practice in some kind of new capacity. Of course, some of our graduates go on to pursue further education in a whole bunch of relevant fields, including PhD level studies and medical school. And then because the field is changing so much, and I know I'm harping on this, I keep saying it over and over again, the field is changing so much and so fast. So in addition to all of these currently available positions, we also recognize that we're training our students for brand new types of jobs that are only just being developed. So this program, the MedGen program, is very much the first of its kind in Canada. And one of the things that makes us really special is that we're a dual stream program. So we accept students either into a clinical stream or into a lab stream. And so in a very general sense, to enter into the clinical stream, applicants should have or be well on their way to obtaining one of these recognized clinical accreditations. And to enter into the lab stream, applicants have to have completed a four-year BSc in a relevant discipline. So I've listed a few up on the slide that we know are a very good fit, but this is absolutely not an exhaustive list. There's tons of flexibility here. So if you have a question about your fit, feel free to throw it in the chat or email me. I'm happy to chat about that. But really importantly, these two student streams move through the program as a single cohort and they do most of the same things. So they get to benefit from leaning on the knowledge that the other group brings. So I'm gonna wrap it up. Hopefully I've piqued your interest. Uh, I just wanna end by saying that we're now accepting graduate applications for a September, 2022 start date. So this year's application cycle is not yet over. If you wanna be part of something really, really fun, we have a great student community, something that will set you up for professional success in the field of genomic medicine, I would really encourage you to apply. If you have any questions about the program, I'm gonna be monitoring the chat and the Q&A here for the rest of this session. You're more than welcome to email me or email our general account anytime. Uh, we're really active on social media also. So look us up on Instagram at U of T Medical Genomics or on Twitter at U of T MedGen. You can also find us on LinkedIn. Um, I would really recommend that you look at our program website, www.moleculargenetics.utron.ca slash medical genomics. That website houses everything you could ever want to know uh, about the logistics of how to apply to the program. Um, and we also have a very active student run blog called the MedGen Project, which I recommend you check out as well. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to post all of these contact details in the chat, um, but that's my five minutes. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Erin. So next up is medical physiology, Dr. Helen Moyotis. Hello, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I hope you can see my screen okay and hear me okay. Um, I'm here to briefly chat in my five minutes about a relatively new program at U of T, the Master of Health Science in Medical Physiology. Um, I'm come from the physiology department where we have just recently celebrated our 100 years since the discovery of insulin. But, you know, we don't want to just lay on the laurels of uh, you know, history. We want to go ahead and push forward and really um, use our current discoveries in physiology and human health to um, move the field forward to applications. So why physiology and why this program specifically? If you're thinking of your future career and are possibly interested in a career as an analyst, perhaps, who can interpret big data sets, but also understand their impact on patient care, or if you are, are a scientist that wants to further understand innovative technologies and the commercialization process, or you're interested in working in diverse teams as a project manager with the skills to organize uh, and understand both research business and clinical points of view, then this program is for you. We are looking at all of these different angles of future careers related to health through very specific core courses for students that have a very good grasp of human physiology to begin with. So really the program rationale is to address the need for graduates who will be interested in the implementation of newly discovered physiological knowledge that is relevant to human health and put it into practice. So working alongside scientists that maybe are creating the new knowledge and really implementing that into various different fields. So 
what some of the main pillars of our program are big data analysis uh, that is specific to health. So students learn coding in R, for example, and begin dabbling in some AI and machine learning algorithms around data sets that are specific to health, like wearable devices, cardiovascular, and a lot of neuroinformatics, for example. We have a course in clinical physiology that is only taught by clinicians, where again, we're looking at healthcare interventions. We also have a course in commercialization of physiology from bringing these discoveries to market. And then throughout the program, there are opportunities to develop more and more core competencies and skills such as project management, for example. So how do we do that? The program is very condensed and fast paced. It is a 12 month program. It is the only one year program of its kind uh, in Canada. And the way that we're able to get away with this is because all applicants should really have a strong background in physiology. So at U of T, there's a minimum of the uh, 300 series physiology courses, depending on the institution. We will consider 100 level and 200 level um, core physiology courses, depending on the institution. So students come in with that high level of physiology and then can dive directly into implementing it. So in the fall and winter term are strictly courses. We have a course in the graduate professional development where students also have specific time allowed so that they can develop things like project management, like I said, if they want to learn other skills like Python and so forth. This happens under this course shell. Every student is also coupled to a faculty mentor to write a mentored literature review of publishable quality. And in fact, our past students have in fact submitted manuscripts for publication already. We have, as I mentioned, our course in big data and health. We have a clinical physiology course. And then we also have a course in commercialization and collaboration in physiology taught by faculty members, both in physiology that are involved in innovation, as well as some speakers from the Rotman School of Management here at U of T. So those are the core courses. And then students have the ability to take three elective courses in physiology from our four major platforms. So if you're interested in neuroscience, if you're interested in reproductive physiology, cardiovascular physiology, or endocrine, those are our four core platforms in the physiology that you can really take very advanced courses in um, that are common to the research stream students as well. All of that culminates then in applying all of that knowledge in an experiential learning opportunity in a practicum. So it's a four month work placement in the summer, and it's intentional that the placement is at the end of the program. Because that means you don't have to come back to finish work. And in fact, I'll show you some data that many of our students are in fact staying on those organizations to continue working after graduation. Some of the sample placements, um, we're a relatively new program. We are now accepting for our third cohort. So our first cohort um, of students last summer, I'll give you a moment to kind of glance over some of these projects that they worked on. Uh, you'll see a number of projects um, using artificial intelligence, both in different areas. So donor lung transplants for um, donor lungs for transplant, using AI to look at assisted reproductive technologies and what embryos are best for implantation, for example. Um, we had students working in wearable textile companies, looking at biometric sensing. Those that were interested more in neurophysiology, we had students working in, with virtual rehabilitation for um, stroke uh, solutions. A lot of our students worked in the neuroinformatics field as well, which is emerging. Others worked more on the business side, so doing a lot of market research support, for example, to bring some discoveries to market clinical diagnostic tools from some of the hospitals and so forth. This is a snapshot of our, some of our practicum um, partners from our first cohort. As you can see, it's a mix of both academic hospital research as well as some companies. More than half of our respondents to our post survey were offered a paid position after their practicum placement. So some of our students have gone on to do some professional schools. Um, we've had applicants, sorry, we've got um, graduates that have moved on to dental school, medical school, and PhDs as well. But a number of them um, are continuing to work in a, in a brand new career now that stems from their MHSC degree. Our students were quite um, satisfied, it seemed, with our new program and a, a 
poll that we surveyed at the end of the program. Um, are those that responded to the question of how would you rate the educational learning progress you made during the MHSC? 100% said very good or excellent. If I were to start my graduate career again, I would select the same program. So 100% said that they would agree or strongly disagree. Uh, sorry, I strongly agree. Um, we have gone through our round one applications are currently in the process of interviews for September. However, we are accepting, we do have spots left for our round two. So if you're interested in applying to this program, then the application deadline is April 7th with all the reference and uh, paperwork by April 22nd. I will put in the chat um, our contacts and our information. So once again, if you have a uh, a strong understanding and interest in human physiology and wish to apply it in some of these emerging fields around data, um, clinical interventions, commercialization, that we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. And thanks so, so thank you everyone for your, your patience. Just two more departments to go. Next is Applied Clinical Pharmacology, Dr. Simi Woodland. Hello, everyone. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to tell you about the Applied Clinical Pharmacology program, which we refer to as ACP. This is a two-year course-based master's, and it's really a hybrid program in that the first eight months of our program are developing your knowledge and skills in clinical pharmacology through integrated coursework. And then the second part of our program is really applying you know, that knowledge and skills uh, to real world settings. If you come into our program with a background in pharmacology, you may be exempted from some coursework that's required and be able to take some elective courses in place. Or if you have an undergraduate degree in pharmacology, then you may qualify for our advanced standing option, which is a one year program that does not include our practicum. This is ideal for people who, for example, have maybe had some real world experience uh, and have worked in industry or government and are coming back for their master's degree and then returning to that employment or for healthcare professionals such as physicians and pharmacists. So we keep our program relatively small because we really tailor it to our individual learners. We meet with you throughout our program to find out what your career goals are and then we work with you to shape your curriculum with respect to your coursework, your research project, as well as your practicum to find something that really matches with what your longer term goals are. We have eight required full course equivalents. Uh, so that's a variety of full and half courses, um, six required full course equivalents, and then elective courses, which includes our internship opportunity. All of our students participate in a clinical research project, and this is somewhat like a mini thesis. So it's full-time research uh, for a minimum of four months. Some students elect to go for eight months, and that often leads to a publication and presentations in the field. And then I'll talk a little bit more about our full-time practicum in a few minutes. So our program is really aiming to develop your skills in critical thinking, in data analysis and problem solving. And we're really working on it, enhancing your scientific communication skills and teamwork. So we have a number of written assignments and oral presentations, group presentations, uh, activities really designed at enabling you to take on different roles within a team as we see in the real world. And you'll do a lot of teamwork um, activities. We even have something called ACP Teams, which is more on the social side of things, but it's just a great opportunity to get you, to allow you to get to know every single person in the program really well by the time you graduate. And we have a strong focus on networking. So we provide a number of networking opportunities. We bring in people from a wide variety of career paths to share their experiences with you. We bring back former graduates of our program. So we're fortunate as the first course-based masters in the Faculty of Medicine to have a number of graduates working in the real world to come back and share uh, the paths that they have taken. Our programs, are a little broader than a thesis-based program. And so we're really aiming at curricular breadth without sacrificing the depth of learning in pharmacology. 
We examined both what drugs do to our bodies as well as what our bodies do to drugs with respect to how drugs get absorbed and distributed in our bodies and eliminated. And we have a large focus, as you can imagine, on drug discovery and development. And so we'll look at all the different phases of drug development and the types of research that go into those phases with respect to clinical trial design and how those trials are evaluated. And also discussing some of the regulatory procedures that need to happen in order to get a drug onto the market. We spend a lot of time on professional development and we will work with you as individuals to look, for example, at your resume or CV and to really identify if there are any gaps there that we can help to fill during the program, how you present these types of materials to future employers and you know, what areas might be beneficial to you for your chosen career path. And part of our program is really helping you to understand what career opportunities are out there. So career awareness is a large part of our program and then career preparedness, how to best set you up for success in the area of your own interest. And one thing I just want to pause and talk about is the student experience. So graduate school should be a lot of fun. Our program is very rigorous and you will work hard, but you'll also play hard. And the best part I think about our program is the people and people get to know each other really well in the program. They form lifelong friendships and they really help each other when they go out into their careers to have those professional networks to enable each other's success and to really foster, you know, transferable skills um, is something we're always working on. And another great feature of our program is just the number of career opportunities. So this is a slide, I can't fit all of our placement partners on here, but it gives you a bit of an indication of the breadth of opportunity with a degree in applied clinical pharmacology. So a number of our students want to work in the pharmaceutical or biotech industries. Some are interested in working in contract research organizations. Some people want to work in government or regulatory bodies be they in Canada or globally. Some students are interested in medical communications. That's a growing area of interest in our program. Uh, students really working in scientific medical or medical communications. Uh, some people are interested in consulting. And if you know, some people have an interest more on the business side of things. And with respect to the elective courses you can take, they don't all need to be science courses per se. We encourage courses in project management. There are business focused courses in pharmaceutical strategy. We encourage you to know biostatistics. So you do have an opportunity to develop the types of uh, skills that you'll need for your intended career path. Our placement is either four, eight or 12 months long. And it is placed at the end of our program because most of our partner employers are looking to hire you on a full-time basis. And so you have the opportunity to transition straight from the program to just stay working with that particular employer. And that's what most of our students elect to do. We do have some students who go off and do professional uh, schools such as pharmacy or medicine, but the majority of our students will stay on and uh, work with their internship partner. So selecting that internship becomes very important. Uh, students certainly move around a lot uh, within, for example, the pharmaceutical industry and try out different roles. But the, the roles are very broad. Some people are interested in clinical trial coordination. Some people are interested in medical information. Some are interested in regulatory affairs. And I've mentioned consulting and um, you know, medical communication. So there's a wide variety of opportunities. With our placement, it's a paid placement at industry standard. So it often gives you the opportunity to earn back your tuition uh, that you've invested into our program. And most of our employers are looking for at least an eight month practicum, but there are opportunities if you wish to do a four month practicum with one company and then try another company, for example, for another four months. Applying to our program, we will look at your entire transcript, but we'll focus on the last two years. And we do remind you to please update your transcript as your grades come in at the beginning, at the end of the year. So you apply, the deadline is earlier than uh, you might have your final grades if you're still completing your last year of undergraduate studies. So please remember to upload those final transcripts. We ask for three academic letters of reference. If you have some work experience that's relevant, uh, we will consider that as well in reference letters, um, but we'd like at least a minimum of two academic references. 
And you have an opportunity to submit a personal statement. It's required in our program that you submit this. And it gives you an opportunity to tell us anything you want us to know. If you know you didn't do so well in organic chemistry in second year, that's your opportunity to say it. But we really want to hear why you think you'd be a good candidate for ACP and why you're interested in our program. And you'll also submit a resume or CV along with that. And we have an in, uh, either a Zoom or in-person interview process. Um, and that's a fairly lengthy uh, interview where we really get to know you and tell you a little bit more about our program. There's more information available at our website or by email. And our deadline for international students has now passed, but we do have our upcoming deadline for domestic students on April 15th. And we really look forward to seeing your application. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, for physical therapy, um, Sarah McMain wasn't able to make it today, but I will send everyone her recording. So next up is speech language pathology, Robin Price. Sorry. Thank you, Rachel. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet. I'm sorry. Now? No. Yeah. Okay. Almost there. Yeah. Oh, you can only see half of it. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh my gosh. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Robin Prince. I'm um, from the Department of Speech Language Pathology in the Faculty of Timetry Medicine. And I'm here to just give you a little bit of information about the program. Um, we were established in 1958. Um, in 2018, it was our 60th anniversary. And we began offering a Master's of Health Science in 1980. Um, in 1995, we began to offer a Master's of Science in the Rehabilitation Science Institute, as well as a Doctor of Philosophy. Um, you may want to know a little bit about what speech language pathology is, um, and it is an autonomous profession, um, which um, has an expertise in uh, typical development and disorders of communication and swallowing, as well as assessment and intervention in these areas. Um, we are, sorry, speech language pathologists are professors, clinicians, managers, administrators, researchers, um, business professionals working in rural and urban areas. Um, they also are professionals with a common commitment to research and public education. Speech language pathologists work in hospitals, schools, uh, rehab centers, private practices, universities, and research facilities. Our program is 22 months, um, and we offer within the, that time five academic units with four clinical placements. Each academic unit is followed by a clinical placement in the same uh, practice area. Uh, we also offer a capstone portfolio. Uh, which demonstrates competence in eight departmental curriculum objectives. Our admissions process um, uh, is uh, for September admissions only. Our deadline is usually early uh, January. 
you can find out more about next um, year's 2023 deadline on the ORPASS website. I'll leave that in the chat um, after my presentation. Uh, we receive over 300 applications each year, and we only accept 60 students per, per year. Uh, admissions pro requirements would be a four-year undergraduate degree. Um, it could be in any um, practice area. Uh, a program area, but we do ask for a minimum of a, a mid B standing in your final year. Um, we also require that you have uh, six prerequisites um, with a B plus standing. Um, you need full, you need half credits in child development, phonetics, general linguistics, um, statistics, and research methods, and you need a full course in human physiology. We also require that you submit two academic references along with one clinical reference and a letter of intent. Uh, we, this year, we asked for 14 minimum clinical volunteer um, hours. However, we waived that just because of the restrictions throughout the pandemic, but hope to like reinstate that um, for next, for next, uh, for the next intake. Our tuition is roughly around 12,300. Um, as um, students come in, we, we kind of encourage them to, um, to apply for an Ontario Graduate Scholarship. Um, that, in, that internal deadline for speech language is mid-March of each year. Um, and that information can be found on our website if you're interested. Uh, we hold an information session once per month. I know this is a, a, a small presentation of what we offer. Uh, don't have much time to like go into all of it in five minutes. It, it's pretty quick. So um, I invite you to, to, to come in on March 30th, which is our next um, information session and learn more with, um, with one of our faculty members and some of our students who do attend. Um, I will also put in the chat our website information as well as my email information if you'd like to hear more about the program. Thank you very much for hearing me out today. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, so right now we have, you know, a little time before two o'clock to answer any questions. If uh, the presenters can uh, open up your video and if the attendees can Type your chat, type your questions in the chat or Q&A, and then we'll get your answers, questions answered. I guess we'll give it a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Robin put her uh, contact in the chat for everyone. Dr. Stiles, what are minimum and average grades to be accepted into the MedGen program? That's a really good question. Uh, so we have an absolute sort of um, drop dead lowest average of a B minus that's in accordance with the SGS guidelines. Um, and then we also like to stick to a departmental guideline, which is a B plus in your last two years. Uh, so I say we like to because there's quite a bit of flex there, especially if you have a lot of practical experience. Uh, so we tend to, as a professional program, we really like to take a sort of more holistic approach to our admissions process. And we have made accommodations in the past and made exceptions on our minimum grade point average in the past 
uh, for people who have who are coming in with a lot of research experience or a lot of professional experience, where we think that's going to give them a real leg up with the programming that might not have been reflected in their grade point average. Um, but I will say that the general average of the students that we take is is well above a B plus, I would say. How does U of T's approach to the UOT program set you apart from other schools? Is Elim here? And he is not here. So um, I will, if you can contact Elim at OT, I'll put in the chat for Elim's contact information. And hey, everyone, thank you. Thanks for all the information. Not sure who could best answer this question but do the graduate programs mentioned today have events or any other kind of events that promote collaboration between students from programs? I'm happy to take this on from the ACP perspective. There are a number of collaborative specializations at U of T. I, my other hat happens to be directing a collaborative specialization in toxicology. Uh, there are a number in women's studies and addiction, and there's a whole bunch of different uh, collaborative specializations. But I think as well, uh, through coursework, you really have an opportunity to meet students in other programs and share ideas, and as well through research presentation days and um, there's a life science, uh, correct me, Life Sciences Career Development Society, which I really encourage everyone to join. And they have a number of opportunities for students to interact and explore different career paths. I've popped the link to the list of collaborative specializations into the main chat. Um, I didn't include it in my presentation partly because of time and partly because master's students in professional programs sometimes don't have the time or, or, or leeway to do the electives that are required to complete a collaborative specialization. But if you do have the opportunity, they're pretty neat. I, I hope you don't mind if I just, oh, no, I have sent you the wrong link. I will get you another link to a list of existing uh, collaborative specializations. This is the instructions for creating a new one. So I'll mute myself and find you the right link. For the BMC, are there any common issues or weaknesses that can come up in portfolio submissions that you can recommend for future applicants focus on improving before applying? Um, I would say probably a mistake that some students do make or some applicants do make is that they will copy a lot from photographs, which doesn't really show the ability to draw from observation or to draw the imagined things that they cannot see. So that, that is one mistake people make. But actually, um, I would encourage anyone who wants to apply to contact us. We, we do review portfolios and provide advice, usually between April and September, if you want to drop by the program. And students find that really, really beneficial in developing their applications. Hey, um, how would you advise students that have not achieved the B plus average for Dr. Styles and Dr. Gottlieb? Uh, if you have a B minus average across your last two years of your programming, I would encourage you to take a kick at the can anyways and make a really good case for yourself, especially with your letter of intent. Um, make a point of meeting with your referees and ask them to consider addressing that point in your in your in their letters about you talk about uh you know how you're great despite your slightly you know b something average uh, if you don't meet the b minus average you would either want to take a few more courses uh, to try to pull it up at the end or go and get a job in a relevant area so that you can lean on that in your application instead of on your grades. That would be my perspective from the MedGen program. I'll let Avram talk about the other programming. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, one of the issues with our program <clears throat> is we're a very small program and we're accepting only five students uh, in each of the categories of PA and CE. And uh, our, our, the number of applicants over the last, uh, now we're looking at our third year, is increasing actually quite dramatically. So um, we're um, really looking very carefully at the full um, application package. Uh, the marks uh, are important for us in, in two ways. One, 
we uh, look at the, the, uh, the score, the, the um, GPA, uh, of course, but we also look at the courses that you've taken. And uh, we would expect that you do uh, reasonably well in courses that um, are pertinent to our own uh, biomedical uh, program. So if we uh, see that um, that is not the case, that would put you at a, at a disadvantage. Uh, and I would, uh, um, um, the B plus average um, is the uh, SGS um, average, uh, sort of minimum, you can go lower than that. Uh, but again, you would be, I would think, disadvantaged. So uh, if you really um, want to go to graduate school, professional or not, uh, it's probably worthwhile taking some additional courses. But what I would do is definitely, um, if you're aiming for a particular program, is to speak to the program coordinator before you sign up for additional courses so that you're going to um, actually take courses that the program is going to be uh, interested in you having, and uh, also courses that will allow them to assess you. And usually that's the, in, at the U of T, the 300, and especially the 400 courses. Uh, we don't want uh, you to take more introductory courses. Um, so I, I think that's where we would stand in, in, in terms of uh, our own program. But I think that's, you know, across the board, pretty much. If I could just jump in to clarify, um, the SGS, university-wide minimum requirement, is a mid-B, so at U of T, 73% or higher in the final full year's worth of courses. Um, if a unit, like most of these programs, have a higher admission requirement, everyone's admission, everyone's marks get checked twice. Do you make the SGS cutoff and if it's marks in the last two years, do you have the appropriate mark in the last two years? Do you need the higher average that the unit's asking for? So they're, 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 they're sort of separate questions. Uh, we have a very good question about taking part-time versus full-time study. Uh, and standard SGS policy is it doesn't matter whether it's part-time or full-time, we're just counting back to your last 10 completed half-year courses. I do know that for the MD program, sometimes they're not as keen on part-time study, but I don't believe that applies to any graduate programs. If I'm wrong, shut me down and, and correct before I misinform too many students. When you're saying a part-time, you mean as an undergraduate you're talking about? Because certainly, at least in our professional program, it's a full-time program. Yes, yeah, so the, the question was about uh, courses for admissions. Right. So if you're, right. if you're a part-time undergraduate student, it shouldn't affect how you're assessed. Okay. Uh, it says, thank you so much for a great presentation. My question is for most of the programs, they mentioned they look at the last two years, but they need to be full-time. What if we have three or four courses for a semester? Does that exclude us from applying for the program, specifically for applied immunology? Um, I think someone actually got rid, oh, someone got rid of it. <laughs> okay, never mind. Oh, I can, uh, okay, you can go with. I can talk about the applied immunology side. I think Emma answered for the um, TRP in the answered column. Um, our program doesn't, um, we, we don't mind the partial course load. What we do is at the time of application, we look at your most recently completed term and we count backwards to get the number of courses equivalent to two full years of study. So we just, so if you're a U of T student, that's equal to 10 FCEs. So we just count your courses until we have the equivalent of 10 FCEs um, at minimum. Uh, we can't, we don't, so if, if, you know, 10 FCEs gets you in the middle of a term, we count the whole term to, to round up, to, to round up to the, to the complete term. So for us, it doesn't matter um, whether you have a partial course load or not. We just count the number of grades to equal a full load. Okay, for the September 2023 application cycle, will volunteer experience in speech language pathology be necessary, or is that our requirement also weighed for the application cycle? Or Robin? Can you repeat that? For the September 2023 application cycle, 
will volunteer experience in SOP be necessary or is that requirement also waived for that application cycle? So that has not been decided yet. Um, we will post that um, soon. Uh, we are talking about it in committee meetings, but it has not been decided. Here's another one for you. I'm interested in the SLP program. I will be considered a mature student. Can you please speak to the current or past student body and how staff and faculty have supported students with children and or those with current employment? Um, so we do ask that all full-time students, they are not working during the program because it's very intensive. Um, however, we do take mature students um, with, um, your prerequisite not being your prerequisites not being more than ten years um, old. Your degree is is forever, but your prerequisites have to be current. Okay. Next question: Does the summer credits also count towards a GPA? Yes. Yeah, so we do take nine non-degree courses as well as if you're finishing up your degree, we we um, consider that as a part of your sub GPA. Can I uh, just make <clears throat> one comment about um, not a, a, a full load, course load? One of the things that um, we certainly look at is the ability of the individual based on their previous performance uh, to handle a, for, a full course load in our, in our program. So uh, with respect to um, both the PA and CE programs, um, the students are exposed to a, a full course load of pretty heavy courses. So I think um, that is something that we consider by any means it does not exclude you at all, but it's just something uh, to basically uh, keep in mind. And if you should um, um, secure a, an interview, um, that, that's likely gonna be a, a question that will come up is that, um, you know, are you able to handle the full course load, which is, um, is a full course load? Okay, so Emma's typing the question for TRP. Um, unless you wanna say it out loud, Emma. Sure, I'll check it. So we got a question about the focus of the TRP. Does that go from science to the community or is there any particular advantage on linguistic abilities if you would like to take a more international approach? Um, so Jude, I want to encourage you to reach out to us by email because I think in this case, it'd be good to discuss your specific situation a little more fully. But to give you a bit of a picture, uh, our cohort does include both international and domestic students. Um, and many of our students have experience um, either working abroad or having been trained in various medical professions abroad. Uh, there is a focus in the program on understanding the health system and how to navigate that within Canada. Um, but certainly there are students in, within the cohort who have gone on to work outside of Canada, taking the skills that they have learned in the program and their ability to navigate complex systems and apply that to other healthcare systems. Um, in terms of linguistic abilities, I, I assume you're, you're referring to ability to speak different languages. There's no requirement to that in the program. The program is English only. Um, but I would, again, reach out to us at trp at utoronto.ca. And I'll be happy to discuss more specifically your, your program, or your, sorry, your, your question and your situation. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. Thanks. You have a couple more minutes. Okay, one, one more question here. Are repeated courses or those marked extra count towards the GPA? There isn't really a way to mark a course as extra at U of T. So that part of the question, I'm just gonna let go. Uh, if you are repeating a course and it's within your last 10 completed half year courses, SGS policy is that yes, that grade would be included as part of your admission average. Okay, um, we have one more minute. Any one last question, anybody? Or if you want, or if any of the presenters want to say any last words.
we recognize that you have a number of choices and a number of decisions to make, and it's it's not easy. I think all of these are great choices, so I don't know that there are many bad decisions, but do spend some time thinking about why you want to do graduate studies, what your end goal is, and how you think graduate studies can best support you in meeting uh, your needs, and that might help you know, guide the program that you select. And I would add that that kind of reflection and thinking will help if you decide to apply when you create your, your statement of intent. Uh, programs are looking for students who know what they're getting into, who know they're a good fit, and show why they're a good fit, why the they're right for the program and the program's right for them. I'll also say that, you know, as program directors and managers and faculty members, we can talk to you about how great our programs are till we're blue in the face, but you're going to get a way more fulsome perspective of the programming if you connect with some current students or alumni. So if you have the opportunity to do that, I would really encourage you to. And if you don't know how to do that, but you'd like to, please feel free to reach out to any of us. I'm, sh I'm seeing a lot of nodding. So I think a lot of people would be on board with that. Um, we would be really happy to connect you with some of our students. If you have particular questions about the program from the student experience perspective, I think that current students or alumni would be able to give you a better answer to those questions than we would. Yeah, I, I, I would just uh, reiterate that, that. I think that's a, a very important thing for our programs uh, before uh, COVID, uh, people uh, would do uh, many observations. So spend a half day or a day, let's say in a PA lab or uh, with a CE. Uh, that uh, fell by the wayside, of course. We do have, as, as Brandon mentioned, uh, videos uh, that will give you some uh, feeling of, of what it's about. But as we come out of the uh, pandemic, I, I would encourage people to uh, certainly contact uh, Brandon and uh, he can uh, advise you as to how to get some of these uh, observerships um, at, at some of our teaching hospitals because the PAs in the program who are professional working now are very interested in attracting more people into the profession. So they're available to help. Okay, I'm going to end the call now. Thanks so much for all the presenters and all the attendees for, for attending. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Natasha.